Today's going to be about preparation. And you see, we have a unique situation here that a couple of scriptures will start off with Isaiah and uh, 1 Corinthians. But primarily understanding that there's not everybody knows exactly what God is doing all the time. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to lead us and direct us. But before God can direct you, you have to turn you off. That's the tricky part. Learning how to maintain sanity in an insane world. A world that's twisted and warped and totally out of connection with the God who created the world. And all that is therein. So we have to depend upon the leadership of the Holy Spirit because without us, the world ceases to be. Do you know that? Yes. Scripture says that it's by Him that we live and move and have our being. That means it's because of the grace of God that we continue to breathe in and out, stay vertical, and that the world does not spin off of its axis. Just half a degree either way, we'd either cook or we'd freeze. Global warming is not, I repeat, not, not an issue. Knowing the signs of the times and knowing the period in which we are now living, that is important. Because I hear nothing in the scriptures that says that we are going to have a global warming episode. What I read in the scriptures is that the elements shall burn with a fervent heat. But that's not going to affect us because we won't be here then. You are, however, going to experience some of the birth pangs. Hmm? You won't be on the earth when God returns you to himself. And when the judgment comes, you won't be here. You'll be returning with him. But there is a crackling sound of the earth beginning to reform itself. Earthquakes and stuff like that are the result of shifting in the tectonic plates. And we are told that in the last days, there are going to be more and more earthquakes in diverse places. We already know that. When you see the news, that shouldn't come as a surprise. Nor should, you know, heavenly events. The old time... Uh, philosophers and students of the Bible used to say that there is no calamity on the earth until there is first calamity in the heavens. The reason for that is that God likes to warn his people in advance of what's going to happen. And this warning in advance is going to be seen, as Jesus stated, by signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. Note the order. Everything Jesus said was for purpose. His whole kingdom is for purpose. Yes. Your life is for purpose. And its only purpose is to fulfill the plan and function of God. You have no purpose on this earth that's eternal. Other than things that have eternal root and fruit. The natural man, the natural woman, yeah, we be born and get a job and the ladies have children and hopefully they've got a husband at home and everything else. That's nice and it's procreative, but it doesn't last for eternity. Your children will eventually grow and make their own choices, presuming they've been raised in the nurture and admonition of the God. Then these young men and women will grow into servants of God and learn how to follow the voice of the master because without that they have no destiny of any eternal value. Listen and see, the work of the Lord, when we find God's purpose, the fruit of that is eternal. If we never find God's purpose, then we have eternal life, but not in the presence of God and the angels and the departed saints. We are all created by God with an eternal spirit. When we die, that spirit leaves the body. Where it goes, however, depends on your choices. People out there don't know that. They're ignorant. Even a lot of the preachers are ignorant. Not all, but a lot of them. Because see, in order to be relevant and viable as a preacher of the gospel, you've got to be called by God. Because without his calling, there's no training. Man can train you, but not God's training. And the purpose of God... Are we on the same wavelength yet? The purposes of God are shared only by God. Everything that God creates has a purpose. When you think about it, all of creation points to a creator. We think of the sun. The sun comes up in the morning. About noontime, it burns its brightest. The afternoon, it begins to set in the west. 
And then when the sun moves the other side of the earth, when its, when its illumination hits the other side of the earth, we get a reflection off the moon. And in the morning, the cycle starts all over again. Because they used to think when the sun disappears from view, it's gone. Now, the sun's still shining. You're on the other side of the earth now, that's all. Because the earth's turning. My point is that God created the sun to bring light to the earth. He created the S-O-N to bring light to the earth. Amen. And just when Satan thought that the sun had set on Jesus Christ, what happened? Another sunrise. Yes. Resurrection all over again. It's the same thing with the creation of, of the food supply. The seed becomes the next season's fruit. That's why we talked last week about the understanding of the pollution of the seed and the creation by man of hybrids. We discovered that hybrids are two similar species, but with different genome packages. You can't mix and have the fulfilling of God's life. The priesthood was not supposed to wear a garment of anything but linen. They were not allowed to use cloth made of mixed materials. Now man is sticking his nose into things which he shouldn't do. Man has also let that warped way of mentality creep into the church. So that the church now has become hybrid. It's got man's ideas intermingled with God's ideas. We call those doctrines. God doesn't have doctrines. God has revelation. God doesn't have ideas. He has truth. So if we're going to find our purpose, my brothers and sisters, then we have to know what the truth is. Satan, to keep you from your destiny and from your purpose, has to withhold truth from you. He doesn't mind sharing some things, but he'll always mix them with a, hath God said. Therefore, in these last days, you'll be able to identify the hybrid church, because it doesn't say with validity, thus saith the Lord. Amen. You came to a prophet under the Old Testament, and most extent of the new, and a man says, to you, thus saith the Lord, it better happen. Or you're talking, you're a man is telling you. That, see, that's why the Lord said, be careful. A lot of people run around saying, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. The Lord says, if it doesn't come to pass, leave him. Because yes. I didn't send him. What are prophets sent for? To restore purpose to the Lord's church. And to restore judgment to the false church. If you're running a false house based on your agenda, it will fall. Eventually it must fall because it has no foundation. Any preacher that's worthy soul has got to preach Jesus Christ and him risen from the dead. That's truth. That'll stand. But Jesus said, when you listen to the Pharisees' disciples, be careful. Because that Pharisees' lingo, their doctrines are traditions of men being mixed with eternal principles. And they are hybrid, and they cannot produce life. They will titillate your natural man and kill your spiritual man. Now we can all go home. I want to talk a little bit more today about that preparation. Because what's happening now in houses like this, you, the people of God, presumably the remnant are being educated and activated for the last day's ministry. Peter says that we have a corrupt, an uncorruptible, incorruptible, I should say, inheritance. Laid up for when? The last days. Your purpose and your destiny as God's people is not going to be revealed to you in its fullness because if you did, then you'd already figure out you knew it all. But scriptures say, here a little, there a little, laying down precept upon precept, line upon line, that eventually you'll start to get an understanding of what God has prepared for you. Now, I'm going to give you a little insight. A lot of times, what will happen, I don't really know what I'm going to do. I told my wife this, I have no idea what I want to talk about this morning. So I'm walking out the door and God plops this uh, remembrance in my mind that last week, he, I woke up about 2 o'clock in the morning and you've got to write this one down. I'm going to give you a little insight from my perspective. This had to do with some instruction that God gave me, the Holy Ghost gave me, at the most 
ridiculous times. I mean, he talks to me in the bathroom, you know, having a shave. I slash myself this morning with those cheap razors that they have now. So none of that is any interest to you, I'm sure. But this is what he told me, and I scribbled it down so that I could share it with you. And I think it's rather profound. I'm, hopefully, hope, I'm hoping that because you have already been sitting here for quite a while, most of you, that profound thinking or revelation shouldn't be something that sticks in your spirit like a, a chicken bone will stick in your throat. Hopefully you'll learn how to listen and allow the Spirit of God to evolve it for you, you know, and bring it to its fullness. But here's the word. In my spirit, I was thinking about the future of the body of Christ. My future, your future, our future. You can put it broadly under the term of destiny if you want to. Uh, however, the purpose of God is more important than what you're trying to figure out with your destiny. If, in all our getting, my brothers and sisters, we ought to be trying... Well, I shouldn't use the word trying. We should be allowing the Spirit of God to reveal our purpose to us. Now, when I say your purpose, it doesn't necessarily mean what you do for God. Your purpose is developing a place in the kingdom where you are fully functional. And before God can give you a function in His kingdom, He's got to drive out the dysfunction from in us. All the stupid stuff that you've been taught over the years... All the anger, all the judgment, all the disappointments, the depressions, all of these things have to be removed, and God's the only one that can do that. Doctors can't do that. That's why they're called practitioners. Why, as Christians, we believe that Jesus Christ is our healer. Why do we believe that? Well, the, the premise itself is based on this concept, that if Jesus Christ destroyed sin, hell, and the grave because he lived a life absolutely free of sin, any sin, then when he was judged for sin, it was an unjust judgment. The judge of the whole world will eventually be God, but at that particular time, Jesus was judged by the forces of darkness, by Satan himself. But the premise of the judgment and the premise of the, punnel, of the penalty, crucifixion, all organized through and by religion, by the way. Satan used religious people to crucify the Son of God. Isn't that an, an anomaly? After that had happened, when the judgment of a sinful man or woman was brought to the throne room of God, Jesus said, wait a minute. I'm an innocent man. My blood that was shed is innocent blood. Therefore, you have no right to hold me down. He went to hell to prove the point. And when he got to hell, he said, you can't hold me here. Why not? Because I'm innocent. And the blood of God which you shed is innocent blood. Therefore you must release me. But not only me. All of those who are in this place. Under false pretense and judgment. Because now I have adopted them as sons and daughters. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? He gave them the choice. Do you want to receive me as Savior and Lord? Yes, Lord. We see that. You've re and said, okay, then today, like you said to the thief on the cross, you will be with me today in paradise. Glory be to God. Now, I say all that to let you know that the premise that everybody is going to heaven is false. Because I, I've shared with you, this is my perspective, and I believe I have the grace of God to say it, that heaven is a dimension. It's not a physical place. How, if you said, where is God? You can't say here or there, for the kingdom of God's in you. What does that mean? It means it's a dimension of knowledge which is withheld from the world. Heaven is also a dimension. The same as faith is a dimension. Faith is a dimension that I like to refer to as the sixth dimension. We have five senses and a sixth one, actually, which is faith that is given us so that we can operate in a dimension that is not of this world. That's why Jesus said, I have a kingdom that's not of this world. You are now receivers of the inheritance of that world, which the world doesn't see, nor does it understand. Most of what we do on this earth is limited to natural things. But it shouldn't be. We ought to be able to break loose of that. Well, I think the biggest enemy we have is not the devil. The biggest enemy you have is your concept of the kingdom. The kingdom is all around me right now. Paul said, don't you know that you have 
multitudes of witnesses, angelic beings that are watching everything you do and say. It's like they are watching from the balconies of heaven and they're watching from the balconies of IGO. There are angels in this house. You know, angels can do nothing unless they are sent forth. Who sends them? I do. No, you don't. Angelic intervention in your life is a direct result of you pleasing God. Because God's the one who does the battles for you. Therefore, if you want angelic intervention, please God. You want an example of that? Jesus in the wilderness, Matthew 4. As soon as he began to make a ripple through the whole atmosphere that surrounds the earth and on the earth, it says that the Holy Ghost didn't pat him on the back, it thrust him out into the wilderness where the beasts and the animals were, where there was dryness and lack of peace. Torment was in that wilderness. It says he thrust Jesus out there and Satan came to him from his dimension invading into the natural space of Jesus not the Son of God Jesus, but the Son of Man Jesus. And tested him and tempted him that he would make a mistake and use his sovereign divinity to deliver himself. And Jesus refused to buckle. In one instance saying, I have the bread. He said, why don't you make these stones bread? He said, I have bread to eat of that you don't understand. Took him up in a vision to the temple, top of the temple, and said, look at all of these kingdoms of the world. Pretty high, huh? All of these kingdoms I will cause to bow down and worship you if you worship me. Again, the system here was designed to get Jesus to step out of the spiritual realm into man's realm and begin to operate according to his senses because that's exactly what Satan did in the garden and that's why so many people today are failing in their Christian walk is because they have become hybrid. They're infected with the spores of the tears that have been planted in the church. If you have a situation where you've got a kingdom-based ministry and you happen to be in a ministry that's been tried and tested, forget about your fallibility because we're all fallible. But if you preach the infallibility of Christ, it's very difficult for tares or goats to establish roots. Because the only way a tear or, a, or a, a false believer can gain roots in a house that's prophetically inclined is that he has to have support from within the house. It's a very, it's a very interesting thought to think about if all the sheep could recognize a, a fake sheep, why would you want to go there? You'd feel very uncomfortable. You remember that ad where they have in TV where the, uh, the, the peanuts are inviting you know, guests and then the nutcracker shows up. You ever seen that? And, he's, and you see him sweating. You know? He said, everybody's welcome. And he's sitting there, because he's a nutcracker. That's what he does. And, and the peanut's got a Band-Aid on his head. <laughs> this guy's, and it's like very uncomfortable for someone to come into a house like this unless God has sent them, A, with a desire to know their destiny. Because your destiny is dependent upon your willingness to tune into that sixth sense. To recognize the dimensions. You see? Satan trying to get Jesus into the worldly dimension. Waiting till he was hungry. See? Getting all his natural senses stirred up. And yet Jesus didn't fail. And it says that Satan departed for a season. And then the angels of God came and ministered unto him. Therefore, we know that angels come to minister to us when we have done the will of God. So you want more interaction with sovereign, divine beings sent of God? Then go about the business of pleasing God, not trying to, you know, talk to angels. Because it's not your works that attract angels, it's your relevance to God, your knowledge of God, your understanding of who Jesus is, Understanding the dimensions of the kingdom. The kind of things that you've been taught here. But you're going to have to make a choice to believe those and doubt the others. Because to discover the plans and purposes of God for you in these last days is simply a matter of obeying the word of God. Allowing the seed to...
to get access to your heart. And what will happen when the word of God, which is the seed, the spirit of God, which is the seed that is planted on the earth so that man could have uh, continued direction. That's why Jesus said, don't go anywhere until you receive the promise of the Father. There's another promise. What's the promise? I'm going to plant the Holy Ghost in you. Yeah? And he's going to lead you and he's going to guide you. whoop de doo But whenever the Holy Ghost comes in, something's got to go. See? One old time preacher said, before the Holy Ghost can go in you, something's got to leave you. And the thing that's got to leave you is you. Death to self, right? Planting of the seed. And in these last days, people want relationships, but based on their own parameters. People choose friends on the basis of likes, not dislikes. If your friends don't like the fact that you're plugged into the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, all those perimeter things, if your friends don't like it, let your friends leave. But like Lot, when the judgment came from Sodom and Gomorrah, you know the story, his wife turned around, there's only, there's only a, just a small family, his wife and himself, and she turned around because her heart was still in Sodom. The world. And those whose hearts are in the world lose their salvation. The salt of the earth turns into brittle rock salt, which is good for nothing, except to be trampled under the feet of the world. The swine will turn and rend you. You've got to learn how to be strong now. All right, let me give you some scripture. Do you remember last week we started with, uh, in James, talking about being patient and persevering, right? And, and I talked to you there, the first part of James 5, verse 7. Uh, it, I'll just read it to you. We're going to have to go back here again because I've got other things for you. It says, be patient and persevering until the coming of the Lord. So there's, a, there's, an, there's an inherent need here for us to continue to strengthen ourselves. How do we do that? Through prayer, of course, through studying the Word, but most importantly, through the fellowshipping of the saints. It's nice to know you're not the only one out there, you know, like the Lone Ranger. You're saying, oh, I'm the last one left. No, you ain't. I've got 7,000 more in this area here, God said to him. You're not the last prophet on the last prophet in the rodeo here. I've got 7,000 who haven't bowed their knee to the devil. Don't start feeling sorry for yourself. As soon as that happened... That was, that was pretty much ringing the bell for the end of his ministry. God had to bring up somebody that wasn't worn out to a stub. But he got his reward. So James, the half-brother, says, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. Now, I told you that, that word there for the uh, uh, waiting for the pouring out of that first rain is from the Hebrew word, which means original teaching. So we know that before the Lord returns, we have to be patient and know that God has to restore the church back to a place where it's hearing the original message of the kingdom. Old and new, but primarily the new. We've got to go back to the roots of what Jesus taught, and what the disciples preached and the apostles preached. Apostolic doctrine, primarily, which talks about government, church government, talks about independence from God, talks about dependence on God, talks about spiritual well-being. Our responsibility is to avoid going places where we're not going to hear the things we need to hear in order to become established and strong. When God talks about you and I becoming stronger in the kingdom, he's talking down, not up. The main thing that makes a tree strong is its root structure, not how much, how much leaves it has. A lot of trees have a lot of foliage on the top, but very small roots. And what happens when the storm comes? Down goes the tree. Down goes the house. So as far as the Lord's concerned and the Holy Spirit dealing with you as men and women of, of God's choosing, is it develop your root structure so that you're not easily plucked up. Yeah? Now remember, Jesus, when he cursed the fig tree, he said, be thou plucked up by the roots. He talks also to the, to the mountains in the same way. If you are the faith of a mustard seed, we talk about that, the only seed that can't be hybrid. hybrid. It remains pure and strong and develops into a large tree. And he says, that tree, that teaching... The strength of that mustard tree is like the teaching of the gospel of the kingdom. People will find it when they find the true thing. They want to make nests in its branches. Looking for the hype never got anywhere. anywhere. Hype is built on hybrid. This is better. It's stronger. It's, it's more juicy. See, Orange is now being hybrided out to be sweeter and bigger and more orange. 
But we don't want more sweet. It's giving kids diabetes. Is that right? In fact, one of the worst things you could do is drink this hybrid orange juice. It spikes your blood sugar. The real article didn't do that. It had something because it released the, the glucose or whatever it was, the, the fructose, I guess it's called, into the bloodstream gradually. This doesn't. It's all designed to give you a buzz. All hybrids are designed to give you a buzz. Look better, sound better, even taste better. But they have no life in them. <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you, if you find a house like this, build your home in it. I'm serious. I mean, I built my house here. I built my house in, in lots of different ministries as I was developing. But God kept moving away. He said, don't get too comfortable in this ministry. I want you to go to somewhere else. And I'll go here and go there. See, the training up, the mentoring of ministries, the way God does it, is moving you from one place of, of, of revelation and understanding to another until you become one who can teach yourself. So I, Paul said, by this time, you ought to be teachers. My God, you've sucked the life out of me all these years. He didn't say that, but that's what he meant. But you're still babies because you, you want to be petted and burped. You prefer a diet of milk. Why? Because there has, you know, babies that are still breastfed or being fed baby food, they have no responsibility at all except in one end, out the other. That's it. And if they're not getting what they want, they scream their head off. Is that right, mums? So they, I'm not happy. Why not? I'm not getting what I want to make me happy. So give me what I want. But you get to a point where, you know, you don't want a 40-year-old man sitting on your knee saying, Mommy, Mommy, feed me. <laughs> well, this is what's happening in the body of Christ. Entertain me. Are you not entertained? See? Yeah, that's my version of Russell Crowe. You didn't get it? Or? Gladiator. Gladiator, there you go. Are you not entertained? Truth be known, he's about that big, he, you know, probably got into the arena without the lenses and the height. If you ever looked at some, you'll see he's got lift shoes on. I mean, <laughs> some of those guys, it's like David and Goliath in the real sense. They probably say, are you kidding me? You send me a dog? Are you not entertained? Anyway, we'll move on. So, <laughs> he wouldn't have lasted very long is what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> so, now I lost track of where I was headed. Ah, uh, the hybrids. So what's going to happen in the last days is a lot of froth, a lot of bubble. I'm just telling you these things. I mean, let's have a look at some Christian TV and see what's going on. I mean, some of the channels have got some good ministry on there, but it's surrounded by really poor, low-level carbohydrate ministry. All the old hype. I, I'm not about you, but I don't want any hype. I don't want any hybrids. I just want the truth. Yeah. And let me figure out for myself what's good for me by listening to people who know what's good for me. It's like going to a doctor and they prescribe pills, but they don't help you. Isn't that right, Blondie? Go to endocrinologists, go to all kinds of people. Oh, yeah, I'll read your letter. Oh, read on. oh yeah. And here's my bill. Yeah, but you haven't fixed me. I can't fix you. They don't say that. It's like I had a doctor the other day say there's certain things that I've been standing against in, in the Lord, and I'm seeing some results. But you know, this doctor said to me, there's nothing I can do about that. It's just you're getting older. So what do we do? Just write me off and lay down for a while? I mean, well, no, it's just, it's just what happens when you get older. No, it's not. That's right. That's right. That's right. No, it's not. I, I don't have to accept that, that judgment that, you know, I'm going to get old and withery. Now, my knees have been giving me heaps quite a while now, but they're getting better. Amen. But the point is, I'm still walking and nobody's chopped me up yet. Meat for the slaughter. I, what cured me? I went and I had, I'm getting off track here. But I, I watched a video of a knee operation. And that did it for me. <laughs> Looked like a slaughterhouse in there. He's covered in blood, squirting everywhere. And this big blob of, of mush used to be somebody's knee. Oh, but it's great now after six years of therapy. And I guess some people, you know, it works for them. But there's a certain amount of like just giving in to circumstances. You know what I'm saying? Roll over and just chop me up. It's like the snow. Why should I roll over? I mean, if I can see, right, and I have a way of going from A to B, I'm going to be here. Amen. So the, the reason I said we're open for God business is because we're open for God business. Amen. Do you have a look at the TVs? This, 
Ministries closed, Baptist church closed, that one's closed, we're closed here, we're closed there. And then these boobs decide that they want to open up the schools yesterday and then call the parents and say, you better come get your kid because we can't get them home, the buses won't work. Well, why did you get them here in the first place, you twit? Let them stay home where they're safe. Who's making these decisions? That's what I want to know. Let's wheel out the moron that makes these bad decisions. Well, they're hiding in the back somewhere. They don't want to come out. They don't want to be interviewed. So that's why I turn off all the news channels, except primarily Fox is going down the tube because it's being sold off. But uh, the American News Network, was it? AO1, whatever. Awesome. One American News. They're having trouble selling advertising. So what do they do? They don't just close up. They just run their own commercials on the system which our founding fathers intended to have. This is awesome. They're great. But they're not, great is not always popular. What God considers great, a lot of people, nothing. Am I right? All right, so we go back in. This is the part I want to see. Don't, it says, be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Don't grumble against one another, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge, Jesus, is standing at the door. Revelation 3.20, right? Laodicea. My brethren, take the prophets, now you may not have picked up on this, who spoke in the name of the Lord as examples of suffering and patience. They're required by God to suffer. But he brings intent here and focus when he says, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the patience of Job. So they're saying Job was a prophet. How did God prepare Job? Well, if you read us in chapter 1, it says, There was a man that dwelt in the land of Uz, and his name was Job, an upright man who feared the Lord and eschewed evil. Great word, eschewed evil. He ran from evil. But he had some things going on in that he wasn't very happy about the way his children responded to his faith in God. And he interceded for them because he had a concern that they weren't going to follow Jehovah. And then, interestingly enough, we find out that who is targeted? The prophet's targeted by Satan himself when he appears in the presence of God. Job's one of the oldest, if not the oldest book in the Bible, by the way. And he says, he, he, he confronts the meeting atmosphere of Jehovah. He shows up with all the other ministry angels. So this is before he was kicked out. And he says, you're always bragging. He said the attitude of Satan then is the same as the attitude of Satan now. He cannot stand it when he sees a man or a woman that's making a stand for God. He's got to try to pull them down. And it's really interesting the way he does it. But anyway, if you go through there, he says, in fact, I wrote this down because I thought this might help you in your trials and, and testings, just like the Garcias are going through here today. I don't know if, if they made it today or not. Are they here? Oh, there you are, darlings. God bless you. Horrible. Decided they'll, I've got to find out who lit the fire, by the way. Oh, yeah. Good job, Stephen. No, it wasn't Stephen. Who was it? Oh, really? Did you open the damper? You did. So there must have been a build-up on the inside. Anyway, they tried to light a fire and get all nice and Christmassy and caught fire and burnt the house down. So, you know, I'd like you to think about that when we take up the offering too because until the insurance company does the right thing, uh, we made some, uh, made some uh, provision for them so they can get what they need because we're family, right? right? And, uh, yeah, so you can't say, well, we love you, but, you know, go and dig through a dumpster for something to eat. So we'll continue to stand. Well, you might want to think about that in your offering today until they get back on their feet and uh, get their house repaired. You know, I know it looks bad to you, but as a builder, I looked at those pictures. It probably looks terrible, but it could have been a lot worse. Could have been, could have burnt to the ground. But the biggest problem is a lot of times it's, it's the departments that are sent to help us. The fire, the fire department, are, thank God for them, but, boy, they just love smashing stuff. Pull the ceilings down, smash this, cut that up, butcher that. It's all going to come good. Now, as far as, you know, something good coming out of a bad situation, this is bad, but you're all still alive. Amen. Right? And you'll finish up with a better house than you had before. Right. Newer stuff. And so, actually, Job and listen to people like yourselves that are going through these horrible circumstances. Uh, Satan comes straight away and says, I see someone is doing something good. The Garcia family, always here to help and be a blessing. You know that. Whenever you turn around, she's got a spoon in her hand or a Bible in the other or something. And the whole family are just God lovers. 
And that's got to drive Satan nuts, right? So for whatever reason, don't beat yourself to death over the fact that, you know, you, the fire caught up. It could happen. Job, same situation. And so, oh, I don't write this down here. These are the things that he did first. First of all, it says that the devil said, if you touch his stuff, three things that Satan came in. First, remove your stuff from you. Take away things, your possessions, the things that make you feel comfortable. Remove all that stuff. And he said to God, if you do that, then he's going to curse you to your face because he'll lose his comforts. Well, that didn't work. Amen. And so <clears throat> he comes back again and says to Jehovah, well, I thought that would do it, but it didn't. So let's do this. The second thing he came at against was his health. You take his health from him, touch his flesh, make him sick. Then he's going to curse you. Well, he'd lost his stuff already. And then he got sick and covered with boils. And it was so tormenting, he was trying to scrape the rubbish off the boil to give some relief. That didn't do it. So Satan came back again. And he said, okay, now I'm going to remove any source he may have of support, his friends. I'm going to send you backslidden friends. <laughs> you used to go to IGO, don't go here anymore. Who probably don't go anywhere anymore. And if they do, they're not happy because they can't stand it when they see you. And so finally, after dealing with his stuff, touching his health, removing any support base he may have, by this time he'd lost his wife, lost his children, lost all his goods, lost his health. Yeah? And now he gets these friends. Nobody needs friends like these friends. But the end result was God continued to come back and said, Listen, if you've, concerned, if you've, if you've considered my servant, and that's linked to a prophet, if you've considered my servant and he hasn't bailed out yet, what else can you do? Because I won't let you take his life. Because his life belongs to me. You can't take his life unless I allowed you to do it. And I'm not going to allow you to do it. And at the end of it, of course, Job starts to become a little bit whiny. And we've all been there. And then finally, toward the end of the book, God says, all right, that's enough. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me now if you can. You know, I just love that whole thing. And it says at the end, and he's ref James is referring to it here. He says, you've seen the end of Job. We count them blessed that endure. You've heard of the perseverance of Job, and you've seen the end which was intended by the Lord. The word intended was, it was a foregone conclusion, that as long as Job remained faithful to God, and didn't curse God and abandon him, even though everything that he loved had been taken from him. He was a sick man, berated now by his so-called friends. And he stayed faithful until he started to whine. And God intervened then because he was seeing that it was, being, it was wearing him down. Now what does God promise us as children of God when we go through difficult times and trials and tribulations? The Bible promises us that God is not a vengeful God and he will not allow you to go through more than you can handle. Is that correct? Now most people want to judge for themselves how much you can handle. But, but you don't know. You won't know until you've been through it. And you're about ready to collapse. Most of us never let it get that far. We're whining so loud they can hear us in heaven. Or, oh, God, look what's happened. It's like, you know, heaven could just open up for a minute and say, shut up. Just shut up. If I could show you what was behind curtain number three, you'd be all happy. But I can't show you what's behind curtain number three until you get over this whimpering thing. It stopped the children of God from getting into the promised land and it'll stop you too. You've really got to flip over to your sixth sense. And as, as Job made the statement concerning you know, his, his end role as a believer, he makes this statement, if I can find it. He says, he talks about, though, though God slay me, yet will I remain faithful and yet will I trust in him? Chapter 13 and verse 15. 
Though he slay me, I will continue to trust in him. The Hebrew children, whether God delivers me or whether he doesn't, I will not bow down and worship you. Now this takes support. You are not going to have people, hopefully in this body, who start attacking you when you make a stand for God and you don't quite understand what's going on. In fact, if you read that scripture in James, everything I'm saying to you now is supposed to give you some you know, insights into how God works. And he said, don't grumble with one another. Isn't that what he says here? That's what he's talking about. Don't grumble against one another, lest you be condemned. What did God do? He condemned the friends of Job. Now, having said all that, the end result, as we read about Job, you know that he replaced just about everything or everything that he had with something better. He didn't lose his wife, though. He kept the same naggy wife. I don't know why that is. It's sort of payback, I guess. But... <laughs> Yeah, well, there was a covenant there, you understand? And God's not going to destroy what God has joined together. It remains a covenant, covenant thought. Go to Isaiah 64, would you? Isaiah 64 and verse 4. This is one I want you to start, you know, put it on your fridge. Isaiah 64, verse 4. And it parallels with 1 Corinthians 2, which we're going to read straight after it. Isaiah 64, the prophet says, For since the beginning of the world... Men have not heard, nor have they perceived in their ears, nor has their eye seen any God beside you. You're the only God who acts for the one who waits for him. What version is that? New King James? Hmm. Close enough. It says, from the beginning of the world, there has never been a man who has not been able to see or perceive by the ear, nor the eye seen any other God beside you, who acts for the one who waits for him. In other words, God is faithful to reveal himself to the one who patiently waits. The man or the woman who is willing to persevere will discover their purpose in God. Now, the other scripture that goes with this, and that's interesting, this just came to me. A lot of times when you're hearing these scriptures and listen to the words that I say to you, they won't, they won't initially ring your bell. But like a lot of things, that after you've heard them and they've gone into your head and into, start dribbling down into your spirit, it starts affecting you. It'll start affecting the way you think, the way you act, the decisions you make. And a lot of what you hear is going to be like that. It's going to be the gospel. After a while, it'll start kicking in and you'll see the effects of it. Just the fact that you're here to hear it blesses me and blesses God. So I'm glad that you make the decision today to put yourself out a little bit for him because that's laid up as eternal treasure. You cannot prepare yourself, underlying the word self. you cannot prepare yourself for what God will or might do. It's impossible. You cannot prepare yourself for what God will or might do. It's not possible. Because whatever you're preparing yourself to be or to do is probably not going to be what you're going to do or what God's planned for you. The second part of it was, but God prepares you for what he is going to do. So let's understand that. Are you listening to this? I was just making you sleepy. If you or I try to discover our purpose or our destiny in God, you can read as many books as you want, hear as many tapes as you want. In reality, God is only preparing you for what he wants for you to do. Everything that takes place, even the disasters, will all bring us to a place, a different place, as it was in Job's case. Jonah is another one. Jonah thought he had all the answers. But notice what happened. It says, and God prepared, first of all, a great fish huh, to swallow up. God's preparation continued to go along the lines of what Jonah was intended as a prophet to do for God and for his kingdom. I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to preach the gospel. There's people that don't know their left hand from the right hand. The cattle are smarter than the people are. But he we talked about there's been cataclysmic events in the heavens which pre-purposed and presupposed the ministration of the prophet to the people. God set the whole thing up. You think God is going to let some puny little prophet stop him from you know, completing the task? Why couldn't he just play, get a replacement? I don't know, because God 
stuck with the one that he chose. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. And so if he chooses someone and they turn out to be flaky, God will work heaven and earth to get that person to complete his task Amen. and his function. Are you listening? Yes. And so it says, when he went off track, God put him on the ship and they threw him up. All of this giant fish, God prepared. And then further on, after he had done what he asked him to do, Job went off, uh, Jonah went off to sulk on a mountainside somewhere and he found a gourd, a, a, like a tree, a vine, and he decided he'd have a little sleep. And when he got under there, God said, oh, you're having a nice little sleep now, are you? You've forgotten who you work for? You're having a little pout, a little depressive nap? So he said, and God prepared the gourd, but then God prepared a worm to kill the gourd. And then after that, he was still whining and still complaining. He'd already done what God wanted him to do. You'd think he'd just abandoned him. Just Oh, no. Because God was still working on the, on the person. So then he rose up a, 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 a very hot easterly wind. And it started to cook him. He'd lost his covering. Now he was totally sitting there in a whiny state. And God said this wind to cook him. It was hot. And he started whining even louder. And God said, why is it? That you're complaining because you, you lost your covering and your shade. Now you're uncomfortable because of an east wind is blowing the dirt and the heat in your face. But you couldn't care enough about the people that I raised you up and trained you to protect and to bring them into my kingdom. Now this is where the church is at. People do not want to be uncomfortable. Now you ask me, why would God do something like that or allow something like that to happen? It's all through the scriptures. I don't understand it either. But when I reached the end of the chapter or the end of the book of Revelation, in that case, it all worked out for the better. They all finished up with more stuff, happier lives, better marriages, more grandchildren. See? And through it all, the key is, the secret is, resist the whining and complaining. The only hope is a person who is led by the Spirit of God. Look, he can be sweet and nice and loving and all that stuff. He can be a very generous person. It won't help you. The best thing you can do anybody is to turn them on to a relationship with Jesus and get them empowered by the Holy Ghost. That's it. And the more we get away from that, the weaker the churches are going to become and filled with tears. And tears attract tears because there's no responsibility. Tears do not like being exposed to spirit-filled people. You wonder why some of your friends don't like you anymore. Instead of us worried about what the high schools are corrupting our teenagers, let's the, let the teenagers start corrupting the corrupted. I've watched it. I've watched it in prisons. I've watched it in some of the schools we used to go to when I was a younger man. You get one spirit-filled young man, one spirit-filled young girl in there, they can turn the whole flavor of that house around. Because God is preparing us for times such as this. You say amen. I want to go back to that scripture because it's important for you to understand so you can teach people this. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, I've got verse 9, right? Let's go back to verse 10, please. This feels more like a seminar in here than... Are you getting any of this? Yeah. It's like dead air in here, you know. I came from a place where people say, Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. Selah. Yes, sir. Preach it, man. Not, uh, uh, uh. You all alive? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Next, there you go. Next verse, verse 11. Oh, I know you are, darling. God's got big plans for you. You're just going to have to worry about getting around people who want to throw water on you. Wear a raincoat. Don't, don't let their negativity pull you down, darling. Amen. I love your spirit and so does God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit which is in him? See, what he's talking about here is your purpose in life. You don't know what it is. I think it's wonderful that we get educated and become a nurse and a, or a doctor or whatever you want to be. But that doesn't affect your spiritual life. It's an attainment which is great and you can use to help people. Glory be to God. But what person really understands their purposes in God except the spirit of the person itself? And if the spirit of the person is carnal, then you're going to be a carnal believer or a natural-minded man. 
But your spirit, once you're born again and the Holy Ghost is in you, your spirit knows the answers. You're going to have to learn. It's taken me a long time to be able to turn one off and turn the other on. Most people don't know how to do it. You say, well, teach us. I can't. It comes a hunger. When you hunger and thirst after righteousness, all these other things will be added unto you, see. Put him first. Stop giving your prayer lists about stuff you want. Thank you, Lord, for providing. It's much more powerful and say, thank you, Lord, I need this. I know you love me, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for forgiving me. I don't, Lord, would you please forgive me? I thank you for forgiving me because I've asked for it. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them, yeah? Forgiveness exactly the same way. You've got to believe in your heart. Logistics don't make any sense when it comes to talking spiritual things. Amen. God's not interested in logistics. He creates logistics. If you don't have a job and there isn't one around, he'll create a job for you. Amen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How do you know that? Because God said he loves me and he'll provide for me. He began a good work in me. He says he's going to complete it can't complete it if I don't eat I'm going to be dead thank you Lord for putting a roof over my head but I'm staying in a hotel I didn't it's a roof isn't it you see how silly we are when we start to hmm? I love that you cannot prepare yourself for whatever God will or might do it's impossible you don't know what he's doing you just think you do all you know is that there's a fire burning in you and like you know I see a burning bush, I've got to go and examine that thing. It looks like a God thing to me. And when you get there and it wasn't a God thing, somebody's sitting there with, making a barbecue, say, oh, sorry to bother you. I just saw the fire burning up here. I thought it might have been a God thing. But all it is is a barbecue. The guy says, no, I'm a preacher. Sit down, have some barbecue with me. We'll talk God. You see what I'm saying? God can turn even a terrible event into something that will absolutely lead you to where you need to be. You can't explain to people why you have the zeal you have for God. See, well, I like to hear you, but I don't know if that's for me. Well, you're right, it's not for you. See? Instead of you saying, how did you do, how do you do that? See? Help me with that. I want to, like the disciples, teach us how to pray, Lord. We want to we wanna see that. Yeah. Why couldn't we cast the devil out of that kid? Instead of just sitting there and saying, oh, well, that's the way it is, I guess. See? The salt's lost its savor. It's good for nothing. You're the light of the world. Don't hide yourself. What are you, what are you ashamed of? Go back to the scripture for me, please. Before I go off tonight, we've received the Lord's tithes and offerings and first fruits. I want to bring you the last sign that you're going to see that Jesus talked about before the coming of the Lord happens. To me, it's interesting, because if you don't want to know, I won't tell you. Just have to guess, have to hope that you, you know, have the right attitude when he comes. And he's not going to come in the morning either. He's not going to come in the evening. He's going to come at midnight. When things are the darkest. When you least expect it, Jesus said. Look up, you're a dead. You know, the thing I hate to see more than anything else is Christians that are dying spiritually they have a stink about them they have that rotten smell about them you've been in any cancer wards though you go into cancer wards and see people when they're like stage five and they're they're just a lump of meat that's rotten we used to go into places like that with my old mentor he said i want to take you to places and show you people that need jesus and you'll find most of them most of them are not interested we went into the cancer wards and you could smell like you know what meat smells like when you've left it outside and it gets that rotten stench? Yeah, that's what they smell. You get close to them, you want to throw up. It's so bad. And every now and again, we'd find one that could barely open their eyes and they'd pull a little bony hand out. So look, if you can't do this, if you could just move your finger or blink, can I pray with you for the acceptance of Jesus Christ or maybe the restoration of your faith in Christ? And they blink like that. Next time you go back there, they're dead. And then other people just turn their head away from you. That's very sad. Yeah. And I've met people who are in the ministry and got so discouraged and so disappointed because their family had turned their back on them and things had happened. Or the family would die with some horrible disease and Satan just came in and just kicked the hell out of them. 
and that same stink is on them. You love them, you want to help them. It's just that they've, they've turned away. And I see that a lot. But I don't necessarily hear them say things that belie their condition. They're still happy. They seem to be. They're smiling and enjoying life, supposedly. But if you approach them about their spiritual condition, they either get angry or they'll just hang up. That's just as bad as a stinking, corrupted body. But it's happening because Jesus said it would happen. Even the very elect, if you're not careful. So anyway, yeah, and it is sad. And that's why, you know, this, me teaching you these things is not because I'm, I'm depressed. I want you to know so you can help other people. Because everyone in this room is surrounded by people who are spiritually dying. And that's why I get sometimes a little, you know, disappointed perhaps when I see people fall and I say, well, I get tired, all that stuff. But if you really care about people, you have to care about people. If you don't care about people's spiritual condition, what is your purpose? Look good, smell good, say hallelujah at the right times. You say, well, I, there's no power in my life. Well, why does God need to give you power? You never use it anyway. Know what I'm saying? Well, of course, you know, but I see this stuff, but I ain't this stuff. Building yourselves up. If you can do nothing else, if you're starting to lose your zeal for God, pray in the Holy Ghost. And teach people about Jesus about His mercy and His grace, about the power of the Holy Ghost. It's the only thing that will keep you alive. This next environment is going to be caustic to Christians. He says, uh, no one's the Spirit of God. Next verse, real quick. For now we have received not the Spirit of the world. See, now he's talking to the believers here. You have not received the Spirit of the world, but rather the Spirit of God, who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Your, this is your purpose, this is your destiny, and this is, your, this is the power that God has made available to you so that you can live a life that's exempt from the judgment of the world. Not that you're perfect, but that you are a different generation, a royal priesthood, and that your purpose is no purpose at all unless it brings glory to your God. Because when you die, nothing else is going to go with you except those that you've won to Christ. The people that you've touched for the kingdom are your treasure. Not everything you've accumulated. The older you get, the more you'll realize that. There's a spirit of greed in this country is, is unbelievable. I know somebody here the other day came in and took a lot of those little angel cards off the Christmas trees. I think that was awesome. But this, there's a lot of requests out there for, for toys. That's okay. The brother said if the kids want toys, give them toys. But I think our priority ought to be give them the things that they need to live. But see, that's, I don't know, I, I watch everything, every Christian movie that I see is children tearing into presents one after the other. Like, rip it open, oh yeah, rip it, oh yeah, rip it, oh yeah. I go to the orphanages and watch kids get a train. I've been there, watch this myself, I took a picture of it. This little boy, he had like three brothers and sisters, and he got a train, a little toy train with wood. And he took one wheel off and gave it to one of the brothers, and he took another wheel off and gave it to took another wheel and, gave it, and then finally he was left with a, a, a train with no wheels at all. And so they asked him why. He said, I wanted to share my gift with my family. God. How does a child learn that kind of unselfishness? Just by living in a place where they have nothing. Next verse, please. Now these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches. That's the hybrid. See? Notice here he resisted and refused to allow anything to come into his churches that would corrupt the people's ability to understand spiritual things. But he said, I only teach those things which the Holy Spirit teaches. Why? Because it's uncorrupted. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You know why he said that? That's how he maintains the purity of the seed. As soon as you preach man's wisdom and mix that with spiritual seed, what do you got? You've got a hybrid who cannot produce life. It's, it's a wonderful thing that you even have houses like this in this city. Honestly, it is. And there's a lot of good houses of worship in the city. I don't have much to do with many of the others or any of the others, really, because they have their thing to do and, you know, 
I guess I do to some extent. But I ought to be able to go there and hear the truth and not have to, you know, sit and wrestle with my head whether or not he's teaching the Bible or not. It ought to be read to me so I, I can think about it for myself. The things of the Spirit, for most people, including most of the folks here, is probably not as real as you would like it to be, but it's more real than you could make it. That's a good quote. However, for us to discover what the kingdom is all about, as I said before, something has to be left aside before that can be taken on. Next verse, real quick. The natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit. That's why so many ministries now are being raised up that cater to the natural man. Because they want to have a ministry, but they don't want to go through the process of having to see people come and leave again because they preach the gospel at them. So, it's raised up by natural men to appeal to the natural man. So what's the point? Why would you even call it a ministry? For they are foolishness to him. You can't grow a carnal church by preaching the gospel of the kingdom. It's self-defeating. Jesus said, the more you preach the gospel, the more you'll run people off. But the ones who want to stay will stay. And they'll become citizens of that kingdom. Amen. Nor can he learn them because they are spiritually discerned. So you need a spiritual teacher and you need a, a desire to understand spiritual things. Next verse. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no man. Because natural people want to judge spiritual people. It doesn't go the other way around. Spiritual people should not, cannot judge carnal people. Does that make sense? Yeah. But carnal people will judge the gazoo out of you. Next verse. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may be instructed or he may instruct him? It says, but we have the mind of Christ. That's the, the Spirit of God in you is the mind of Christ. Next verse. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal, as to babes in Christ. We talked about that earlier on. It's a very gentle smack on the tush. He said, I'd like to be more spiritual with you, but you're insisting that I be carnal like the other people around the corner. And I can't. I can't do it. It's not good for you. Now, two final scriptures before I receive the offering and let you go. We spoke about the inheritance which is reserved specifically, Peter says, in 1 Peter 1, verses 1 through 5. You can read that for yourself later. This inheritance is ready to be revealed in the last days by the Holy Ghost. So your purpose is going to be revealed in its fullness. The closer we get to the Lord Jesus Christ's return, the more revelation is going to be spread in the house of God. Amen. That's why we started off with the Laodicean church to lay a foundation for what I'm trying to teach you. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1. The falling away from the faith. Can you put that on the screen so folks can remember it again? He says, but I know this, that in the last days, the last of the last days in the Greek, it says perilous times, stressful times, wicked times will come. Next, keep going. Next verse. For men will be lovers of selves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And he goes on further, and all of these lovely traits here. This is going to become more and more pronounced in the body of Christ. And then, of course, it talks about the falling away, the great apostasia, the apostasia in Greek, the falling away from the faith. What is this falling away from the faith? It is the hybriding of the church. Those who are being required to let go of some of their ancient ideas of what the kingdom is and accept this new modernized version. And in so doing, you lose your life. It becomes the false church. It becomes the, false, it becomes the church of the Antichrist. That's, that's the building of it. Sooner or later, all of those churches will start combining under one and persecuting you. Do you understand that? Yes. So buckle up. This is great. It's going to be a great ride. But Jesus said when all this begins to happen, Luke 21, 28, look up for your redemption is getting closer and closer. And the more you see the persecution of the saints, look up. Your redemption is drawing nigh. Now, this is the last sign. I don't know if I've got time to do this now. I'm not, probably not. The last sign before the return of the Lord deals with the ten virgins. Five wise, five foolish. And I think probably we'll leave that till next time I see you. But if you start to read that just as homework for yourself, you'll discover that when the Lord 
when the Lord, when the trump begins to sound and the organization for the coming of the Lord and for the final uh, supper of the Lamb, it says, the five were wise and had oil, Holy Ghost established in their lifestyle, and five did not. Now, it's interesting, as you read that, you'll discover that the five unwise virgins, they're, they're all virgins because they have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Virgins here are just a type of one who is unspotted by the world. Understand? Yes. So they're all being, at one point, born again. All ten of them were virgins. The difference was five had become corrupted. And their corruption was identifiable because they had lost their zeal for the things of God. And they had no more oil left in their lamps. Their lamps were going out. Lamps were fueled in those days by, by oil, olive oil usually. I've got a couple of those lamps that I brought back from Israel. They're very common. You get Everywhere you can buy them in the shops over there. Little clay lamps, just like Aladdin's lamp, but small, about this big. And they used to light the home with them. They have 50 of these little lamps burning in people's houses. They didn't have electricity, did they? All right, so what was happening is after a while they didn't care that much about keeping their lamps stocked with oil. The lamp or the light was the life of God in them. After a while they, they ceased caring that there was enough Holy Spirit in them to keep them zealous. People like being around folks like you, but they also resent it. Because I don't, I don't, I don't get excited like you do. Why are you so happy? Why are you so excited? Oh, glory to God, I don't know, I just, I feel good, I've got life in me, man, what's the matter with you? And it says that they let their lamps almost go out. Now they hear the five headed toward the marriage supper of the Lamb. Everybody's rejoicing. The Lord's coming, look at the signs. I'm looking up my redemption. They say, you're so happy, what do you got that we don't have? We all have the same thing, except you let your connection with the Lord dissipate. They say, well, give us some of your oil. I said, I can't give you my oil. Why? Because it was earned. Do you understand? It's not something you can buy. I, I earned my relationship with Jesus. My, my future, my destiny, my purpose can't be planned for. I just so, told you that. That's what the Lord told me the other day. To t tell you, you cannot plan for your purpose in God. Your mighty, mighty ministry may finish up being, you know, driving people around in the go-go cart here. It may be working in the bookstore, maybe working in the nursery, looking after newborns. Whatever you find yourself doing, the Bible says rejoice in that, for this is the will of the Lord for you. This is where your training is. Don't worry about whether you're going to be doing in five years or five days. It doesn't matter what God's got you doing now. You do it with all of your heart, with all of your might, with all of your strength. Amen. Scripture said, whatsoever things you do, do them as unto the Lord. This is my function. This is my purpose. So what if I'm not a worldwide evangelist? So, so what? You know, all I can do is be friendly and help young girls to establish themselves with a godly walk. Or as a man, you know, help young boys to decide for themselves you know, what's, what's good, what's bad. What's righteous action, what's unrighteous. If you teach him anything else, it's useless. It's useless. It's just, oh, he's a nice guy because he tells me what I want to hear. You've got to tell them what they need to hear. Yeah. And when it comes to you promoting your ministry, you don't know what it is. What kind of arrogance is that? If you're flowing in it and you can prove it and the fruit of the tree determines what you are in its, in its natural sense or its spiritual sense, good for you. You've got a right to say so. But otherwise, God's still training you to be what he wants you to be and what that choice is is up to him, not you. Make sense? So the answer to those five unwise virgins was you had the chance and you didn't look after it. Now you want me to help you get into the kingdom? I can't. Because each one is sealed by the Holy Spirit individually. You need to be telling this to some of your backslidden friends. You really do. Because to one extent or another, if you keep bumping into people that used to be a part of you, or used to be your friends, or used to be strong in God, and now they're not, and you keep bumping into them, and they keep calling you, or you just see them, that's not by accident. You already had a relationship with them, so the Lord is entrusting you to do something about it, not just ignore them. And follow up with them. You know, some of you folks bring people in here. I think that's awesome. Candy and others, that's awesome. But you've got to follow up with these folks because one or two times what's going to happen is you start to get them on the right track, then Satan immediately going to snatch them away. He'll find something else to distract them. Amen.